Hi everybody and welcome back to another episode of I Am Journal Club. We did a little poll last week and the study that generated the most interest was the Nordic study, which is the first RCT of colonoscopy for screening of colorectal cancer. Our guest today is the study's author and principal investigator, Dr. Michael Brattauer. Michael Brattauer is a professor of medicine at the University of Oslo. Let's jump right in. Professor Brattauer, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I would like to ask you a personal question first. Uh, in a Zoom, in a recording of a Zoom meeting you were in, uh, I saw the word Zweifel, uh, doubt in German, in your background. And I wanted to ask um, how you developed, uh, if you were that model, uh, if there was a particular coincidence or a person that inspired that. Yes, so that's right. It's a good observation. So I have uh, in some of my Zoom calls, I have that as a background. It's an art installation, as you say, with the German word Zweifel, which in, in English would be translated to doubt. But in German, it's, lar it's a larger term than the English doubt. And it's an art installation that was exhibited in Berlin, Germany in the 90s on the roof of the East German Parliament building, which later was teared down. A Norwegian artist called Lars Romberg, who, who had this installation up there. It's big letters, 10 meters high. Zweifel or doubt, I think, is one of the leading uh, themes uh, in, in my research, and I think should be uh, for most researchers. I think research is about finding things out uh, and if you want to find things out, you do not know if the things are better or worse or equal to the things that you compare them to. In other words, the outcome of the research is unknown. And as a researcher, you should be open to any outcome. You may have a hypothesis of something is better than something else, but you need to be prepared for, for any outcome. You need prepared for, you know, that the experiment will confirm your belief or you need to be prepared for the opposite as well. And you need to, um, uh, and, and therefore the theme should be doubt rather than enthusiasm or belief, which would be kind of the opposite. Uh, you believe something very strongly. You don't have a doubt that it works. That's not a good starting point for a researcher. Mm. You, 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 can be, you should be enthusiastic about your project about doing your project, doing your experiment, the outcome, however, there you have to be, I think, you have to be uh, prepared for anything. Uh, and that is more in the category of doubt than enthusiasm. Mm. Yeah. And it is, it could be both a noun, also an imperative uh, doubt. Um, yes, yes, yes. It could, yeah, it works also as an imperative. Yes, yes, yeah. 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 So when I talk to younger researchers here in the research group, or when I give lectures, I always for example, I do courses for new PhD students here at the university. I always start with that because I think it's beneficial for people that they think um, clearly about these overarching things before they do anything in research. So uh, you published, um, you actually, uh, our first guest who is the author uh, or the PI of both, uh, the first author and the PI of a paper we're discussing. In other words, we've always discussed uh, our uh, the papers we've chosen with other experts. Uh, so you were the PI and first author of a major paper of the Nordic study. And if I can just briefly summarize it for our viewers and listeners, it was a pragmatic trial, uh, which we could do another methods primer on, of an invitation to screen for colorectal cancer or CRC with a single colonoscopy versus no invitation. Um, and then you randomized and invited participants in the general 55 to 64 year old population in parts of Norway, Sweden, and Poland, where there were no colorectal screening colorectal cancer screening probes at that time uh, between uh, June 2009 and 14. There were nearly 85,000 participants in this those three countries, and that didn't include Dutch participants, which couldn't be included because there was any privacy law in the Netherlands. Um, so the top line results um, are that for your primary endpoints, colorectal cancer incidents and uh, related death, there was no statistically significant difference. Uh, but for um, uh, colorectal, uh, sorry, there was a statistically significant difference. Correct. But for, Coincidence. Um, 
but not for, for death. For incidents, I'm sorry. And not for overall death. And not for colorectal cancer related mortality or overall mortality. Correct. Um, so my first question is, um, how to plan something like this? This must have been like in the late 2000s when you started thinking about this and then you ran it for 10 years. And now you published it in, in a journal. So a publication like that, which well made waves, um, but had quite a lead time. Uh, how is it to, to work on such a big project for so long? Well, it's both fun and it's, of course, very um, demanding, um, difficult. I think you need to be a little crazy to do projects like that, because just as you said, I mean, it takes a long time and uh, it's difficult. And people tell you that it's not possible to do it. It's a very bad idea. Uh, you have a hard time getting funding for it. Um, because obviously there's no pharma involved or industry, but it's also fun because you were, you know, obviously this is not me alone. It's a big group of people who did this together. We had the first meeting in 2004, and then we had meetings uh, many times each year for some years. And then we had a protocol about 2007, 2008, and then we applied for funding, which was a big struggle in itself. And we finally started to do the study in 2009, as you said, and screened for uh, five years uh, and then followed up all the people. So it's a, it's a, it's a long-term investment. But it's not like you have to work full-time on the trial every day during the 17 years. Yeah. Of course, um, there's times when you work on it full-time and, and more than full-time. And then there are other times where you just sit and wait for the data to come in. Mm. Yeah. Right. Mm. Um, so I believe that there might be a big misunderstanding about the study. Um, when people read it, they might think it's a trial of colonoscopy for screening, but it's really about the invitation to come in for a screening. Isn't that right? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, so, so let me just just say that I, to me, this is this is a trial uh, about colonoscopy versus no colonoscopy. However. In all randomized trials in medicine, regardless, you always ask people, would you like to be in a trial, you know, comparing A and B? And then some people will say, yes, I would like to be in a trial. And that's usually where you start. And then some people will actually do what you ask them to do, what they're assigned to do, what they're randomized to do. You know, take this pill every day for a year or do this examination, do this uh, exercise program every week for two years or whatever you would like them to do or get a colonoscopy because you're randomized to it. And then there's always some people who do exactly as you want them to do. And then there is some people, sometimes a lot of people who do not do what they're randomized to do. Um, and this is exactly the situation here. There's a little difference as compared to, for example, a drug trial, uh, because we didn't ask people before they, we randomized them. And that's the difference here. Yeah. And that's where the where the where probably some of the misunderstanding comes from. Mm -hmm. And that was very intentional because we wanted to understand how does a colonoscopy screening program, so an introduction of an offer for screening to, let's say, a country mm -hmm. or, or a state or a city, how does that affect the incidence and the death of colorectal cancer in that country or in that region or in that city? Uh, and, and that's exactly how we designed the trial. We randomized everybody who lived there in the age group, as you said, around 60 years, randomized everybody to either getting an invitation to colonoscopy, so an offer, an opportunity, or no offer, no opportunity, which was standard of care. And then some people who were randomized and got the offer said yes, and some people said no, just as it would be in a, in a population in a country if somebody sets up a program. And therefore, we have this situation where out of the people who were randomized to screening, 42% actually said, yes, I want to do this and came and had the colonoscopy. And 58% did not have the colonoscopy. They chose to say thanks, but no thanks. In that sense, Yes, the trial investigates the invitation or better framed, I think, investigates what happens if you offer, if you start a program in a population. But then from there, you also would like to know, OK, what actually happens in the people who actually choose to come and have the colonoscopy? Because that's obviously that's these people are the, are the people who can benefit from it. You cannot benefit from an intervention that you choose to not having. 
And therefore, we have this, this two layers of analysis. We have intention to treat. That's like what happens if a program is introduced. And then we have the second layer, which we which is our pair protocol analysis, where we look at, okay, what happens to the people who actually receive the intervention? How is their instance of death of colorectal cancer as compared to the people who did not have the offer? So let's talk a bit uh, about colorectal cancer. So it doesn't have the highest mortality compared to many other malignancies, but it's still very common. I believe it's the third most uh, most common cancer in many countries. Most of the cases occur after age 40, unless you have a genetic syndrome, and uh, 90% start with um, polyps, and uh, most cases appear after age 50. Often here, it's the only cancer where you can find a precancerous lesion, lesion, although there's also cervical cancer. Um, but you can at least remove the polyp in the same session during the yes. colonoscopy. Yes, so yes. So there might be unique about uh, colorectal cancer. Um, so from running the trial and also from your experience as a practicing gastro- gastroenterologist, would you say that most patients um, are more or less at ease doing uh, some kind of colorectal cancer screening? Well, I think the people who choose screening they accept the screening. The people mm-hmm. who don't choose don't accept it. So I think I think the people who choose this are more at ease because the others don't say, no, I'm not at ease with it. I, I don't want it yeah. for some reason. Yeah. And these reasons may have a you know a fact-based explanation or just an emotional explanation. You yeah. know, I think usually, and, and that's a little difficult to find out, but usually the people who accept are different from the people who don't accept. And oftentimes... The people who don't accept are the people with more risk factors for the disease as mm-hmm. compared to the people who actually say yes. So mm-hmm. the healthy say yes, the unhealthy, if you want, say no. Yeah. And maybe it should be the other way around because mm-hmm. the unhealthy have a higher risk of, for the disease. Yeah. Yeah. If that was the case in the Nordic trial, we are not we are not entirely sure about it. Mm-hmm. We have some data that we haven't published that and we'll look into that. But uh, it's obviously it's um it's something that interests us a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about one of your uh, two primary endpoints, uh, colorectal cancer incidents. Uh, so this was very elegantly detected by the national cancer registries in those three countries. Mm. And in the capital my curve, you can see that the lines cross. And then um, just before the 10-year mark, you see a statistically significant difference. Uh, I think the baseline is 1.2%. And then there's a 0.22% absolute uh, reduction, which is about an 18% relative yep. reduction. Um, and then uh, that translates to like uh, a number needed to screen of around 455 I calculated. Yes. yes. On the other hand, would you expect that this difference actually might start to grow after the 10 years? It's a very good question. It's a very good question. I uh, the, the, the short answer is I don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, because this is obviously the first trial. When we designed the trial, and I think all the way up to the publication in the New England Journal, if you had asked experts in the field, so what is what is a good follow-up time for a trial like that, for a screening intervention like that? Most, I think, would have said 10 years. Now, after the trial was published, some people say, well, you know, you should have waited another five years. I think it's too short. And I think... Some of that reaction is triggered by the fact that the uh, that the the benefit was not as large as some people had hoped. Mm. So that people were thinking eighteen percent is 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 not enough. And then you think, okay, why would that be? And you well, you know, we probably it's too short. Uh, I think it's a little unfair comment, but of course, you know, uh, it may grow with time. Uh, we have seen that. In some other colorectal cancer screening trials, for example, for sigmoidoscopy, so half the colonoscopy, that there was an effect after 10 years, sometimes had a little larger effect after 12, 13, 14, 15 years. So, so yes, maybe, maybe not. We will know because we will reanalyze the data. We, it's still ongoing. Uh, and, and we will see that if there is a difference between 10, 12, 15 years. Mm-hmm. For death, however... I think to me, if you ask me the same question for colorectal cancer mortality, I think we will probably see a larger effect or an effect. There's no effect right now uh, over time, simply for the reason that the death end point requires more time because it takes time from people from getting the disease, which is the instance end point, 
to dying from it, which obviously is, is always later, and for some folks, some years later. And therefore, I think um, it takes more time for death as compared to incidents to see an effect. And our death endpoint was powered for 15 years. So there, I I think we will see something evolving over the years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the colorectal cancer related death. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And then what does Sweden do differently? I know they had a lower adenoma detection rate, and maybe that's not because of the quality of colonoscopies, but because of a lower colorectal cancer incidence in yeah. Sweden. Yeah. You, I mean, no, in Sweden, I probably shouldn't say this since we're in Oslo, but uh, the countries are not too dissimilar. Uh, no. Is there something special about the diet or the habits of the Swedes where they might have a lower serious incidence? It's a very good question. I think, I think, the colleague, the researcher who finds out, you know, this difference between countries, for example, will get the Nobel Prize. So I, I have no clue. And it is fascinating. We just discussed it here in the office the other day. What could we do to find out why why that difference is in background incidence or risk of colorectal cancer? For example, between Sweden and Norway, very similar countries, the same ethnicity of people, the same language even almost, uh, neighboring the same social system, the same healthcare service, but um, the incidence of colorectal cancer are much higher here as compared to there, yeah. which also then reflects in, in adenoma detection rates, as you say in the study. Nobody knows. Yeah, I have no clue. <laughs> Not fewer red meat or smoking. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, also now, the, the past three or four years, the, the incidence of colorectal cancer is also starting to decline in Norway. Hmm. So right now, and this is something that is very new, it's observed right now, the past couple of years, it's going downwards. It's, so it's going, it's going towards Sweden, also in Norway. Which also, again, is interesting. Why does that happen? Why why did the curve, you know, bend downwards suddenly now the last two or three years? Well, we had this increase that we didn't understand. Now we don't understand the, the bending of the curve downwards. We, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's uh, switch gears and talk about the U.S., and I know you've also weighed in on the discussion there. Mm. So um, I think people tend to think uh, chronoscopy is the only modality that's recommended. Of course, that's not true. Yeah. Um, there's a, a high sensitive fetal occult blood testing. There's um, uh, fetal immunohistochemical testing. There's lumen reports for chronospies, virtual chronospies with CT, and also a sigmoidoscopy is so on the books uh, with and without uh, fit testing. Um, so uh, critics argue that, of course, the evidence is very uh, scarce for most of these modalities. Uh, do you think that um, for uh, luminal chronoscopy, um, the, the intervention you tested here, the, your results put that modality over the hurdle in terms of its, its evidence. It's the first RCT to investigate um, chronoscopy versus nothing. Yes, I think it does. I think I think this trial is um, it's not definitive in because first of all we will follow these patients further, so we will have new data with regard to longer term effect, and also um, it is there are other trials out there that comparing fecal testing with colonoscopy, which is an important piece of information that is still lacking. But for colonoscopy screening, yes, uh, I think I think it's it's that that thing that we have been waiting for. Now, that puts the US into an, a very interesting position and also a different position as compared to European countries over here. Because in the US, colonoscopy screening, as you say, is introduced, has been introduced for some years, for many years, and is actively endorsed. So the question now is, okay, with the 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 benefits in the trial, do you think still think it should be endorsed the way it has been the past 15 years, or should there be some kind of tweak or rediscussion about the value of colonoscopy? And that is something that the you the people in the US the the guideline makers and the policy makers and of course clinicians need to discuss with each other and with patients um, because obviously I think the expectation in the U.S. is that colonoscopy is more effective than the eighteen percent percent that we observed in the in the trial. Uh, I think the expectation was that it was much better than than what we saw in the trial. Yeah. For Europe, however, where Almost no countries have introduced colonoscopy screening. Germany has, uh, and Poland has, 
That's and Austria. That's the only countries. All other countries have introduced fecal screening programs. Uh, I think for those countries, if I would be in charge of those countries, I would say, well, I don't think there's a reason to switch to colonoscopy right now, because it looks like that maybe fecal testing programs are as effective as colonoscopy screening programs. Yeah. So you're looking forward to a head-to-head -head study between fit testing and colonoscopy? I look forward to it. Yeah, the Spanish trial, there's a Spanish trial that I think will have 10-year results next year. Mm -hmm. It will be the first one. Then there is a big VA randomized trial mm -hmm. that will take another maybe five years. And then there's also the Swedish trial. Yeah, yeah, the Striestro study. Mm -hmm. So in that study, I think they test, uh, the, the fit testing arm is every two years. But um, in the US, it's recommended to do that every year, actually. I guess the interval of the fit testing obviously is very important guidelines in the US. Um, mm -hmm. The United States prefers the granted services mm. as for Iceland. What this um, um, every other year study shows. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. The trials that will be coming at the Spanish trial first, they they will not be able to tell the difference between yearly testing and testing every other year, and they will not be able to tell you how effective fecal testing is as compared to no testing, mm. because they only compare fecal testing every other year with colonoscopy. That's the two comparators. Yeah. And actually, participation with both methods in the trial was very low, a lot lower than our colonoscopy uh, participation in the Nordic trial. And I'm sure people will argue what this means when the trial comes out. But it gives you that, 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 um, that perspective. Fecal test every other year versus colonoscopy, what is better? The yearly testing that the U.S. recommends, and the, U the U.S. is the only country that recommends yearly testing. All other countries recommend every other year. Personally, I, I don't think there's a big difference, but uh, we don't have any good trials comparing these two methodologies. And then I think the CRC screen guidelines have also been one of the first that were impacted by modeling. For example, the yes. sudden age uh, was changed from 50 to 45, not based on randomized controlled evidence or even observational studies, but based purely on modeling. Since we're maybe beyond the realms of um, efficacy, do you believe this is valid that we should use this sort of data points from the, for example, the two year, every two year fit testing and then model and then sort of have a rough estimate at least to inform guidelines? I think it's okay to do modeling if one likes to do modeling like this. Uh, if it's enough to uh, inform guidelines to change, for example, from 50 to 45, the answer is no. I think it's a mistake. <laughs> mm. And and the simple reason is that the data points for the modeling are so uncertain that I don't think they should, they should, one should make guideline recommendations for such an important topic. We're talking about millions of people uh, on, on such a modeling with so little data. Mm. And just by... Just a simple fact, if you look at the absolute risk for colorectal cancer in the people below 50, although it has been increasing some, that is correct, uh, it's very, very low. It's much lower than the 1.2% we have been dealing with in our trial. It's a lot lower than that. It's a lot lower than 1%. If you have such a low risk, absolute risk of disease, there's very little you can do with, with uh, reducing that risk because it's so low to start with. And most people, I think, if they would be aware, would say, I don't bother. This is this risk is, you know, is so low, I don't bother with doing anything with it. That yeah. would be my perspective, at least. Yeah, I think the mean age at baseline in your study was around 59 years. Yes. Um, so do you think um, there is a right starting age? Would it be closer to 45 or closer to 60? I guess it's also a question of how do you power the trials? You would probably have to have absolutely uh, have had to had a lot more uh, patients in your study if you had screened at fifty. Yeah, yeah. We started uh, the youngest in our trial were fifty, the oldest were sixty four. So the median age was just below sixty years of age. It's just as you say, if you go further down, you need a lot more people because the prevalence of disease is so low. Uh, so I, I don't think it makes sense to screen people below the age of fifty. However. Then you have that thing that you just described some minutes ago beautifully. The, the, the purpose of colonoscopy screening is not to detect the cancers. It's to detect the polyps, remove them, and then thereby reduce the risk of, of cancer in the future. That means that 
you should ideally go in and look at people before they're reaching their point for the early cancer, but like 10 years before, if you think the polyp takes 10 years to grow. And because we really don't know, it does it take eight years or 15 years? It's it's a little hard to know when you should go in and look for polyps the first time in in in, in the course of, of a patient's life. I think that's that is maybe at 50 and and maybe from there on. Mm-hmm. Some people argue it's much earlier, it's 40 or 45. I I'm not sure I see the evidence for that, but Again, uh, there's not much data out, out there for this, so it's yeah. difficult. And then you, the earlier you do the first test, then that might necessitate a second or even third test if you do 10 year intervals. Right? It does, but it also, you know, if you're going very early, let's say you do it in 25 year olds, mm-hmm. um, the risk of having polyps at 25 years years old is low. So you could do that, and then you could say, and then the question comes: Okay, what do you do with people who don't have polyps at that first look? Do you say, ah, you're fine. You don't need to come back. Or do you say, well, you know, I want to see you in five years or 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. Nobody knows that either. Mm. Yeah. How, how do you think your research should be used? Uh, I guess it could, as you said earlier, inform uh, policy makers in countries whether or not to introduce screening programs. But it could also be used on the individual level, you okay. know, and the doctor's office in the individual conversations with the with the patients to make uh, shared decisions. Yes. Um, what do you what do you want our viewers and listeners to sort of take away? What should they look at when they make these decisions mm-hmm. themselves? Yeah, yeah. I would be happy if people use it exactly for those in those two circumstances. One on the policy level, should I, you know, introduce a program in my city or my state or my uh, in my health insurance constituency, uh, and then you would probably like to look at the intentional treat analysis because you expect some people to come and some people don't, and and you can estimate how much money that would cost for for your your city, and then you would use the eighteen percent for incidence, and you would use the ten percent for mortality, and you would play around with those numbers and calculate the costs on the individual level. It's much more, then I would look at the per protocol analysis. So actually the people who came versus the other ones. Uh, and there we have numbers like 31% reduction for incidence. Within that, in the, on the individual level, if I would be, you know, the, the primary healthcare provider and I have a, a patient in front of me who is 60 years old and wonders, should I have a colonoscopy or 50, whatever it is, then I would take the numbers from the trial. I would ex- start explaining to that person, here is your personal risk of getting colon cancer in the next, let's say, 10 years. In the trial, it was 1.2%, so around 1%. Let's make it simple for people, around 1%. Uh, There's also good calculators on the internet where you can put in your age and you can put in if you smoke or drink or or are obese or have a family history. And then depending on that, your risk will be go a little up or down. From that personal risk, and let's say it's 1%, I would say, well, you know, a recent trial showed that from your personal risk, which is 1% if you don't do anything, you can reduce the risk of getting colon cancer by 31%. So if you subtract 31% from 1%, you're going down to about 0.7%, which means that if you have a colonoscopy, you could reduce your risk of getting colon cancer over the next two days from 1% to 0.7%. And then I'll explain that person what a colonoscopy is, what it means, what it entails, what you need to do, uh, how much it costs if you pay yourself, and then you can make your decision. Mm-hmm. Do you think we should have more decision aids to help patients make these decisions? Maybe it's very difficult for a patient to understand this number, is it 1.0 and 0.7 percent? Yeah. Uh, I think so. I think most people understand the percentages. Uh, if you just give them some seconds, it's often it's not it's not often done. So people not used to it to have that conversation with their doctor. So it needs some training on both sides, I think. But when I explained this um, to my mother, for example, she understood what I was talking about, yeah. uh, and she has no medical background or education. Um, so I think it can be done. Decision aids, yes, and there are good decision aids actually out there. There's a guideline for colorectal screening in the British Medical Journal two years ago that actually has very nice infographics that are very useful in that kind of conversation that show you with figures and you can play around and click on buttons, what your risk is, what your reduction is. It shows you visually very nicely what you can expect. Uh, So people can use that. And I know that some general protectors here in Norway use use that infographic when they talk to patients about uh, corrective screening. 
And Professor Brethauer, uh, thank you very much uh, for speaking with us today. Thank you. It was good being here. Here are my six personal takeaways from our conversation with Dr. Brettauer. First, the invitation to a screen in colonoscopy did lower the risk of colorectal cancer by around 18% and if accepted by around 31%. However, because the baseline risk was 1.2% over 10 years, you needed to invite around 450 people to prevent one case of colorectal cancer. The risk of colorectal cancer-related mortality and the outright mortality did not change over these 10 years. But it is unclear how these three endpoints change after 10 years of follow-up. Fifth, these uh, results can be used both by public health folks who make decisions about population-wide screening programs, as well as in individual patient-doctor conversations about colorectal cancer screening and in those decision aids could be used. And sixth, we don't know yet how colonoscopy stacks up against other colorectal cancer modalities. Thank you for watching this episode of I Am Journal Club. We hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and to our podcast. And we will see you in the next episode.